Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Minerva Tantoco. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm very honored to be introducing the next panel uh, at the MAS Summit. I am Minerva Tantoco, the Chief Technology Officer of New York City, the first ever. In this inaugural role, our goal is to coordinate a citywide technology strategy and to use technology for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Our vision is to make New York the most tech-friendly and innovation-driven city in the world. Kind of a tall order, but we're gonna go for it. Um, uh, I have spent 30 years in technology um, and the last uh, 17 years as the chief technology officer helping large and small companies transform their businesses through technology. In fact, my first job 30 years ago was a startup um, in Silicon Valley in the mid-1980s um, <clears throat> when I was still a junior in college. So, you know, I have some idea what, what it's like to start a new company and, and try to change the world with it. Um, I, I also feel that the, um, the creation of this chief technology officer role in New York um, is a testament to the commitment of the de Blasio administration and the importance of technology in government. Because in the role as CTO for New York City, we have an unprecedented opportunity to define the role of technology in government for the digital age. Things like democratizing our data, empowering people with, um, with economic opportunities, and using technology to equalize the voice of those who don't uh, have a voice today. And one of these key touch points is the intersection of policy and regulation with new business models that are enabled by technology. So I've been on the job three weeks, it's my three week anniversary. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and I look forward to working together with all of you and with all of our partners, um, both in the public and the private sector. I'm pleased to introduce a panel on policies that enable innovation as part of the dialogue that I look forward to continuing with you all. Thank you. So as Minerva mentioned, um, we're going to be talking about these policies that enable innovation. Um, and we have a great panel here with some of the most dynamic economic players today, um, whether they're tech companies like Airbnb and Uber, or small businesses that are abandoning brick and mortar outposts like food trucks. Um, these businesses have something in common, which is that they're running into some conflicts um, with regulations, particularly regulations that were intended for businesses of another era. Um, and so we're going to be talking a bit about um, policies that can enable innovation and also ones that you know, perhaps are, are stifling it. Um, and given that we're in the New York Times building, I thought I would start off with um, referencing a, a piece that ran in the Times this past weekend um, that perhaps uh, our representatives from Airbnb and Uber saw, um, which is really looking at why tech companies in particular are sort of um, running into a lot of lawsuits, um, friction around regulations. I mean, it ended with this line uh, that these old and new tech companies alike um, view regulations as little more than roadblocks standing in the way of innovation. And so I would like to kind of start off with that premise and, and ask um, our panel to kind of comment on, on whether you agree with that statement or not. Um, and in particular, also David um, Weber, talk a little bit about what, uh, what that intersection between regulation and small business looks like for non-tech companies. So perhaps you want to start, Ashwini. Sure. Um, so no, I, I certainly uh, don't think of regulators or regulations as, as roadblocks. Um, and, and I say that because 
I've been at Uber for five months, and for the four years before that, I was the taxi cab regulator here in New York, mm -hmm. and I wrote some of those rules. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> they're all they're all great rules. <laughs> uh, <laughs> New York does it right. So, um, uh, no, look, I, th I think uh, that you're you're always going to find a disparity in sort of the speeds that which. Uh, entrepreneurs and innovators in the private sector move and that regulators and government moves at. Uh, even sort of the more innovative entrepreneurial um, uh, representatives in government. It just takes a little while to sort of get the vision that is, is sort of in the entrepreneurial DNA. Um, so I certainly don't view regulation as a roadblock. Um, the, the, the position, the, the sort of the stance that I took when I was a regulator, the stance that Uber takes uh, when working with regulators now is to collaborate, um, and and so if you if you want to sort of continue with that that road analogy, uh, regulations are good regulations are guardrails. They provide bright bright lines on what really matters um, and creates a space for the private sector to develop innovative solutions. Um, those bright lines are around safety, they're around consumer protection, they're around equity of service, um, and, and as long as they're, they're clear and as long as they're equitable, um, I think the private sector needs to, needs to acknowledge the value of those, those guardrails. Great. How about in Airbnb's case? I think that's right. I mean, of course, government can be a roadblock if they choose to be. But we've worked, I mean, we're working in 30 cities right now. We've gotten new laws in Amsterdam and Hamburg and France and Portland and San Francisco and Portugal um, because governments have looked at the issue and come up with rules of the road to create those guardrails instead of a, a roadblock. Um, and I think it actually, comments like what the New York Times said as a, create sort of a disservice because then you get to some governments and they say, oh, you just don't want any regulation, so we're not talking to you. Mm -hmm. There's assumptions made about innovators and disruptors that we just expect to get what we want and there's, there's no give and take. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. We have teams of people eager to engage with governments, and we think there's reasonable regulations that can help everybody, especially the consumers that we are serving. So it's actually kind of troubling to keep hearing that said over and over again and, and completely untrue. Yeah, um, I guess speaking as someone who spends a lot of time on the road, uh, we, we think about these, these rules and regulations a lot. And uh, uh, like the other panelists, we, we really try and approach it from a collaborative perspective. And I think it's not uh, regulations per se that can be difficult, but regulations that don't change and aren't responsive to the way in which business is done and the potential that uh, entrepreneurial efforts can, you know, improve uh, the city and improve, uh, you know, opportunities for uh, New Yorkers. Um, uh, you know, for, for us in particular, we're looking at a lot of rules and regulations that have been around since 1965 uh, that refer to street vendors as hawkers and hucksters. Um, and we haven't <laughs> been able to, you know, bring even the language uh, to the 20th century. So, um, you know, we're excited to, you know, continue a dialogue with the city in a collaborative manner. Um, we're just looking for, uh, I guess, a little bit of an assist, uh, staying focused on things that matter most, food safety, pedestrian safety, clear, transparent rules uh, that really serve the community at large. Sure, and a lot of people know uh, a lot of the dialogue around Airbnb and Uber these days. Probably a lot of people don't know about what's kind of going on in the food truck industry. And perhaps if you could give us a little bit of a snapshot of kind of some of the regulation issues that you're dealing with. We were talking a little bit earlier about the limitation on permits in New York. What's the sort of status here? Yeah, so there's a number of challenges uh, that, that you know, mobile vendors and food truck entrepreneurs face in the city. Uh, one of the first is just the permitting structure uh, is is not market driven. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons that that might be the case, but uh, it does uh, institute a couple of constraints on who can enter and, and exit the industry. Uh, and even for the current players, and this is where we're spending a lot of our time, uh, is thinking about fair ways for uh, vendors to compete. So one of the biggest challenges that food truck vendors face is they have permits to vend in New York City, on New York City streets. They have to get citywide permits. Um, but in fact, there's laws that have been on the books since 1965 that you can't vend from metered parking. In 1965, meters were just introduced to the city. It was very rare to find a meter. Here, every commercial district is metered, but every commercial district is where there's demand from the public for a wider diversity of uh, 
food options. Um, so that's that's a strange catch-22 that that you know my community is caught in. They have a permit to operate, but no safe place in a central district business district where they can operate. Uh, and the second is around uh, the licenses for employees on the trucks. Um, again, looking at, at regulations that have been around for 50 years or more, every single employee on a food truck has to have a sales tax certificate certificate of authority from New York State to collect sales tax. And ordinarily, that's something that just a business as a whole has. So it's a very slow process. It can take two months to hire an employee. Uh, and it's, these, are, these are huge constraints on small businesses with maybe three to five to 10 employees. So uh, you all mentioned kind of col a collaborative approach to regulation, but how does that really work when, um, say, Uber is being outlawed in certain states? How, how do you collaborate at that point? And how do you move the dial to perhaps create kinds of regulation that would actually sort of enable your businesses to work and satisfy also sort of public needs? Yeah, I mean, so, Outlawed is uh, it, it, that's funny because it's 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 like the it's like that Times piece and then sort of that 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 final line. If if you read the press, there's this drumbeat of uh, of 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 these businesses being outlaws or being banned. And if you were to take it on its face, we wouldn't be in any market anywhere. Um, and the fact of the matter is, we're in 200 plus cities across 40 plus countries. And the way you do that is. Is to have that dialogue even through the even through the conflict. So even when we uh, are in a market and the regulator is saying, "Well, that works in San Francisco or that works in New York," but this is in certain name of city and we're different, and so you you can't operate under our regulations. It really is peeling back past that first layer, mm -hmm. that initial reaction of this is new, this is different. It doesn't fit the rules that I have on the books, and so I'm trying to fit it into this into this, uh, this square peg, into this round hole, that conversation is around, well, this is different. And just imagine for a moment if the regulations that you have on the books didn't apply here, what would you, if you had the luxury of writing new rules, because many states and many cities have done that, for this, new, for this new product, what would those look like? And when you engage in that dialogue, more regulators are willing to sort of sit down and, and really look at their regulations and see, well, what made sense for taxis in 1965 um, before the advent of cell phones, forget smartphones, um, and before you had the ability for passengers to rate the, uh, the drivers, um, and before you had the ability to make sure the driver wasn't taking a circuitous route because you've got GPS. If you peel all that back, uh, and you distill those regulations down to their core, it really comes back down to consumer protection, passenger and driver safety, and equity of service. And then your regulations that you're now writing from scratch can really aim at those and, and not bring in sort of what I like to think of as the barnacles on the boat mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the regulations that have sort of accreted over decades. So the, the, that, that relationship between, between our policy folks and the regulators in the different markets um, is actually a pretty constructive one, and no one writes about that <laughs> because it's not really news. Uh, but uh, that's that. So, th so the actuality is very different than than what you often read about. Um, but that's that's where that's where you know that's why I have a job <laughs> to have those kinds. Of um, well, speaking of writing new regulations, I think that's some of what has happened in some cities where Airbnb has worked with cities like San Francisco and, and Portland to kind of um, change some of the regulation to ensure that, um, you know, Airbnb services are legal and that also that, um, you know, some of the, the public's needs are being met, taxes are being collected, that sort of thing. Could you tell us a little bit more about kind of how that process works and, and sort of also, you know, what do you do when you're faced with, um, you know, a city or state that is uh, really not willing to, to change its regulation? Sure. Um, so it really starts with information. I think what you see is there's, there's generally a lot of hysterics early on in an innovative situation mm -hmm. where people are complaining and they're the loudest. So, you know, in the last year, we've had about a million people stay in New York on Airbnb. 
those people don't contact government. They come here, they have a great time, they go home. As far as I can tell, there have been three or four dissatisfied customers. And as far as I can tell, every single one of those people was on the cover of the New York Post. <laughs> so if you just read the New York Post, you think, oh my God, this is a nightmare. People are coming and destroying the city and all this stuff is going on. But if you look at the numbers, you know, we've, had, we've, been, a, we've been a company for six years. We've had 20 million people stay on Airbnb around the world. 10 million just this year, since January. So what government is doing in a lot of places is they look at the number, they look at sort of the news and they say, what is going on and how can we stop it? Mm -hmm. What they should be doing is saying, 20 million people stayed in someone else's home? Mm -hmm. Why? Like, what should we do to help that? Why? What's going on out there that we don't understand and how can we fix it? And so what we found, thankfully, in most places around the world is that first they sort of react, and Amsterdam was a great example. The, Amsterdam's first reaction to us was, you have to shut down right now, you're a criminal conspiracy, <laughs> you're ruining the city. I mean, literally, that's <laughs> basically what they said. We went in and we talked about who our hosts are, what the community is like, how it protects the city, the sanctity of the city, um, the rating system we have, we offer you know, host guarantees in case something goes wrong, all the different things that we do to be responsible. And then they did their own study, and then literally six months after their first comments, they said, this is actually one of the best things that we could ever do for Amsterdam. We're gonna pass a new law allowing people to rent out their own homes, because this makes sense. They have a web page informing you how to do it. They have regulations in place to stop people who are doing it in like a thousand apartments, but to make it very clear you can do it in your own house. And that's all we're asking for around the world, and that's what we've done in city after city. We hit, San Francisco is complicated for affordable housing and other reasons, and we sort of get lumped in with problems that aren't really about us, but people use us because we're in the press as a, a convenient tool. Mm -hmm. And in New York, who knows what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in New York even, you see a lot of the press is bad. Like I said, mm -hmm. a million people came and the only four you read about are the people who had an issue. And you know, law enforcement's trying to figure out what to do, the government's trying to figure out what to do. Um, but we've had extremely constructive conversations behind the scenes, which are never in the press. You know, we've talked about taxes. We offered to pay taxes, and then the hotel said we shouldn't pay taxes. Um, so you're always engaging in new challenges. But I think the real story here, um, like with Uber, is that most of these discussions are totally rational, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, trying to figure out, okay, what do we do with this activity? How do we stop bad guys? How do we allow good guys? Mm -hmm. and, and we can usually work that out. So I'm confident we can do that even here. So you mentioned a little bit about um, the fear that, that your company is going to, quote, ruin the city or, you know, um, change the city. And I think that that's, you know, at the end of the day where a lot of um, the reaction comes from is people are afraid of, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how, um, you know, online um, services will change the character of a city. Um, and I think that, you know, what's really interesting, especially in light of the conversation we've been having about the built environment here, um, how these services actually change somebody's experience of the city. Um, and I'm curious to know, David, with food trucks, I mean, it's definitely a phenomenon that has um, popped up in, in all sorts of cities around the country, around the world. How do you see um, your business kind of affecting the way that people experience the city? Um, well, you know, like even if you, you look backwards, I mean, one of the things that I see people doing all the time is uh, eating a hot dog from a streetcar, like, taking a photo of themselves with the Empire State Building in the background. <laughs> um, street food is a part of New York City. Uh, it's an iconic part of New York City. Uh, and there's been a lot of innovation. And uh, uh, there are, you know, in a lot of ways, New York City should have the best street food in the entire country. We have the best, you know, culinary talent here by a lot of measures. Uh, we have a very pedestrian culture and we have really like unprecedented urban density and a pedestrian culture. So, you know, you, you would think that you know, mobile food would be thriving here. We would have a lot more trucks and carts uh, than any other city, uh, and a lot better. And 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 by a lot of measures, we don't. Um, and and part of that is the constraint of of regulation. Um, I think that you know, there's definitely great entrepreneurs doing great work. Um, Fox just put out their their list of the top hundred food trucks in America, and of the top five, three of them are in New York City. So, you know, despite these constraints, people are still doing great work. But uh, there's a lot more that food trucks could do if they were used tactically by the city uh, to activate public space, to get more eyes on the street, um, promote street safety, um, and to stimulate tourism, 
uh, incubate new businesses that grow from uh, a mobile business into a brick and mortar as so many of our members have. Um, so there's a lot that, that food trucks offer to the city uh, itself. And uh, I think above all, it really comes down to customer demand. I mean, I think the reason that we're all here is that the public likes us, you know, like we're very likable. We have yummy, fun food uh, <laughs> right when you want it. And, um, you know, that's the one thing that keeps us going and I think keeps, you know, regulators, you know, uh, who are also our customers, um, open-minded about thinking about creative ways to try and work with the constraints that they're facing in the past of regulations they've inherited to come up with something that works uh, better for the future of New York. Yeah, and I, yep. I mean, so th that actually brings to mind. There's, it's, it's important to sort of underlying all this is knowing kind of who the players are in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's the innovative companies that are providing a new service. There's the regulators that we're talking to, but that's not the only that, that's not the only folks that are engaged in that conversation. It's the customers who love the service, who sort of will tweet their public officials if they feel like someone's going to take my uber away um, and then there's the then there's the established industry whether it's the hotels whether it's the restaurants whether it's the taxi mm -hmm. industry that obviously has a has a dog in the race and so when you when you hear sort of the the the, the alarmist uh, the alarmist tone of you're going to destroy the fabric of our city or you're, it, there's going to be there's this parade of horribles that's not the regulator necessarily, mm -hmm. I say necessarily, that's not the regulator necessarily that believes that or is putting that forward. There is this sense of, you know, as a, as a former regulator, I would get my information on the industry from the industry for the most part. I mean, I would ride taxis and I would experience firsthand, um, but a lot of what I'm hearing about the health of the industry, a lot of what I'm hearing about the different business models, I'm hearing directly from people who own businesses in that industry. So not any fault of government or the regulator, but that's if that's where you're getting your input, it's a limited, it's a limited uh, slice of, of what you're hearing. And so this notion of this, this parade of horribles or the awful things that are gonna ensue if you let this new business model in, it, it needs to be understood with that backdrop. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I, I, there's a story uh, that a guy I know tells uh, sort of to help me put stuff in context mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, the invention of the taxi cab mm. dates to about 1600. And so in London, uh, there used to be these watermen. They would ferry people across the river. Um, and the advent of the handsome cab uh, in the late, in the early 1600s, sort of this notion of you could get a, pup, like you or I could get a handsome cab to take you somewhere as opposed to lords and ladies. Um, mm. That came about in the early 1600s. And these guys resisted it more than, you know, more than anyone's resisting us. They resisted the building of bridges across the river because that was going to cut into their revenue. And there was a parade of horribles. You know, uh, a handsome cab can't go more than five miles an hour. Uh, because it's a, it's, it presents a danger to people walking in the street. There had to be someone walking ahead of the cab, sounding an alarm so that people would know this thing was coming. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I tell this story because it puts in context and, and underscores just kind of how ridiculous those arguments are. And mm -hmm. obviously, building bridges is a good thing. We should connect our cities. Uh, having wheeled conveyances <laughs> as opposed to relying on ferries <laughs> to take us from one part of the city to the other is a good thing. Um, and, and, and I think, take that step back, take that long view of history, uh, people will realize that about these new business models. It's just in the fog of war when you can't see more than six inches in front of your face, it's hard to, it's hard to realize kind of where, where, where these fit in. So. Do you think that there are examples, uh, perhaps, of regulations that could spark innovation rather than sort of stifle it? So, I mean, have you, have you experienced it, whether within your industry of seeing sort of, um, you know, regulations that have, just by virtue of them creating a constraint, um, new enterprises that just kind of pop up um, in order to take advantage of, of some aspect of a, of a quirk in regulation? There certainly can be. Yeah. Um, what you more often see is government trying to do the right thing and accidentally stifling innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was in government for a long time, and, and same thing. You hear from the big industries talking about why it's necessary to protect the big industry. And you don't hear from the innovators, because the innovators are out there just doing their thing. So it's a lot harder to, to spur innovation. It creates innovation because you have to get around regulation, but that's not necessarily something to be sought after. Mm -hmm. That's just 
that's a fact. Um, on the other hand, there are definitely regulations to protect consumers, like we were saying, um, that make sense. And so there's always, you know, leveling the playing field, creating a safe environment, creating rules of the road so everyone knows what's happening, makes a lot of sense. It's just, you can go so easily too far. And what we really look at is trying to get governments to, to take a step back first. Look at the whole picture, look at what 10 years from now is gonna happen, what really benefits them and the city and the consumers in that city. The idea that you shouldn't be able to call a car service doesn't make any sense, except for their taxi company. To them, it doesn't make any sense. But for every consumer in the world, they're like, oh, that's great, I have options. <laughs> right. So. Um, yeah, and, and I think that just thinking of the handsome cab and like the specifics of, you know, like imagine if today we still had someone sitting on the hood of every cab, like sounding the alarm, like <laughs> those specific kind of neat, actually. nuanced, yeah, it'd be fun. Um, the, those nuanced um, regulations are, I think, you know, part of the obstacle that we're all facing and saying, you know, like, let's take a step back and think of, you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish in a larger sense and really staying focused on safety, cleanliness, uh, and whatnot. I think that, you know, different cities have different ways in which they've approached uh, vending regulations. And, uh, you know, there's across the country, you know, every municipality is tackling it in its own way. Uh, and it makes sense because different cities are, are different in, in different ways and are trying to optimize for different things. But um, a couple of things that I've seen that I think are pretty interesting, Boston, um, which had the opportunity to do this because they had no legacy uh, vending industry, uh, have made every permittee uh, as a requirement, they have to have a GPS on their truck and they have to share, share that GPS location with the city. Uh, and that allows the city to do a lot of interesting things. If they want to inspect a truck at any given time, they, they know exactly where it is. Um, and also, you know, they've embraced it as a point of pride. Um, so they know where all the trucks are and, you know, facing the community, you can find every truck in Boston by going to a government website. Um, so it's kind of a, a fun, a fun application of technology that really is a win-win both for the consumer and for the regulator and for the entrepreneur. So, it, it, yeah, so it, it does happen. I mean, <laughs> government does innovate, but, and, and I have an example in mind, and as I'm thinking about it, it underscores for me just how difficult it is for that to happen. And, and to, to David's point, how infrequent that, infrequently that happens. I mean, you don't have to look much farther than, than New York the 6,000 green taxis that are circulating outside of Manhattan are an example of government innovation. This was a need that had been there since the Koch administration. It had been identified as yellow taxis don't really leave Manhattan. Um, we have the data, 97% of trips uh, originate in Manhattan or the airports, leaving you know 80% of the city without street hail service through you know, quirks in our rules. And so uh, that, that was an example of, of government innovating and then bringing it about, but just the tortuous process that the, uh, that the Bloomberg administration and then the Cuomo administration had to go through in order to bring that about underscores just how much, uh, how much, how many resources the government needs to marshal even mm -hmm. in order to bring something like that about. I think uh, probably a more appropriate role and, and what you can most hope for uh, for government innovation is not so much government as innovator or as, or as entrepreneur, but to sort of borrow from the tech parlance more as an incubator. So creating a safe space and hospitable space for people to come in and, and, and innovate in government and in the private sector that's what you'll see more of, and that's that we see all the time uh, in, in, in markets that we enter. So we have time for one last question, um, and it kind of goes outside the regulation issue, but um, you know, but it relates back to sort of the, the ecosystem that you described beyond just, you know, regulators and businesses. Um, Uber has drivers, um, Airbnb affects the housing market. Um, and, you know, there's been some gripes about, uh, you know, the, some of the deals between Uber and its drivers or is um, Airbnb by virtue of um, it becoming so popular, raising the rent in certain markets. Do you see your companies respond to these sort of outside pressures to, um, you know, provide better wages or deal with affordable housing, or is that really sort of outside the kind of the purview of where where your companies reach? I mean, that that's smack dab in the middle of what you know what, what we as a company need to 
to, to address. Um, it's uh, it's kind of hokey, but the, there, you know, in the company there's this expression of we we give our passengers high fives, but we give our drivers hugs. <laughs> and if you don't if you don't have if your drivers aren't happy, then your your service is, is it's going to reflect in your service. Um, I think what we provide uh, to to drivers, primarily drivers who are leaving the taxi industry, is is a is a welcome change from what what a lot of folks have described as a serfdom model. So uh, a taxi driver starts out the day about $150 in the hole because uh, you have to pay a lease to get the taxi because it's got this medallion attached to it and it's government's fault that there's a medallion system in the first place and then and then the cost of fuel and so forth. So a, a driver hasn't even broken even until midday at which point th then, then they start earning. Um, what we've endeavored to do is to provide a, a, a dose of sort of small small business entrepreneurship uh, to, the, to that model. So you, you can own your own vehicle. There isn't a medallion on top of that. And the, the numbers bear that out. So a full-time Uber X driver in New York City, um, the, the median income is 90,000 gross. Um, so that's the way that we think we can best Address those address those concerns is allow drivers the platform to make money, make more money than they ever did uh, uh, previously, and 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 then those issues sort of follow from there. There's more to be done. I mean, I think as with our dealings with regulators, our 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 interactions with with the folks who drive on our platform is an evolving thing, and I think we'll we'll end up in in a, in, a, in a place that's that's better for all. Can I add to that? Um, so you mentioned affordable housing, and that, that's one of the kinds of things that gets thrown at us mm -hmm. um, as a reason for why we should be stopped, mm -hmm. why our users should be stopped. But if you look at the story, I don't think it's a surprise that we've done well since 2008. It was a bad economy. The leap to rent out your own home is a big one. You know, a lot of people do it because they want to do it, especially now, but in the beginning, a lot of people do it because they need to do it. It's the only thing they can see to afford their rent. You know, if they've just lost their job or they've lost, you know, one income earner, the rent goes up. So it actually keeps people in homes they've been in for a long time. It makes the city more affordable to them. It creates sort of a stable platform so that people aren't constantly moving out and having wealthier people move in. That would raise rent. Mm -hmm. So we actually think it's quite the opposite. We've done studies, we've had seen studies that show that we help affordable housing, we don't hurt it. Um, but broader than that, what we really provide is this freedom to do so much more you know, this, the story people call us disruptors and, and everything else. The real story isn't us at all, it's about the people who are doing this. Um, and they're doing it for a reason, they need the money, they want the freedom, they wanna spend more time with their family, they wanna start a business, they wanna write a book. I mean, we've had prize-winning novelists, we've had so many different stories of the, of the thousands and thousands of people who host. And that is creating a new economy that is different than the regular economy. And people don't know quite what to do about it. You know, it's not, a job, most of these people have a job, mm -hmm. and they're using this to supplement that income or to work a little bit less and, and do something else. And those people are starting businesses and creating all sorts of new ecosystems that we don't control or can't anticipate. And what government should be looking at is how to foster that kind of thing, because that's what's amazing. I mean, Uber drivers too. I mean, the, what's great about an Uber driver, what, if you ask an Uber driver, why do you like Uber, which I do every single time I'm in, <laughs> which has been hundreds of times, <laughs> They almost always say the same thing, which is I get to work when I want to work. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be I had to pay 150 bucks and I had to work 15 hours to pay that off. Now I have a car. If I want to work 12 hours a day, I work 12 hours a day. If I want to work two hours a day and spend time with my son, I do that. And I make more money and it's safer for me and it's transparent and I like the system. That's good. I mean, that's really good because it gives people in an industry an ability and a choice to do something different and have more flexibility. And that's what I think all of us do. Great. Well, we are out of time, um, but please join me in thanking this panel for the great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.